Hello everyone and welcome to the May 2022 ULEAD webinar. I'm so thankful that you have joined us once again. We may have some new people on the webinar for the very first time, or maybe you are just someone who you come every single month. And so we really, really do appreciate you. If you are, have you, if you've been here before, you know the routine. We love to know who's on the webinar because we can't see your faces. So go to the chat section, open that up, and just tell us who you are and where you're from. And we would love to just be able to communicate with you. And Michelle and Catherine are both here today, so they'll be monitoring the chat section as well. And so if I didn't say that, uh, my name is Kelly King and I'm the Women's Ministry Specialist at LifeWay. And so again, it's always good to have you. I have just a couple of announcements and then I have a special guest with us today before we jump into our topic on building your Bible study library. And so there's a lot of great things that we're going to discuss today and things that you're going to want, but just some new things that are coming out from LifeWay. If you have not been you know, if you have not been aware, Christy McClellan, one of our newer authors, has a brand new study out called Gospel on the Ground, and it is, it looks fantastic. I can't wait to start digging into this particular Bible study, and so if you are looking for new Bible studies, hey, go to LifeWay.com, look at all the women's Bible studies, but definitely check out Christy's new study as well. And then also, I didn't have this in my list, but I have it right next to me, I have the new LifeWay Women's Bible. Bible. And if you have not seen this, it is absolutely amazing. Um, I have just, I got my copy about a week or so ago and I've really, really enjoyed it. So definitely you want to check that out. You can go to lifeway.com and look under Bibles and you're going to find that pretty quickly. And we're going to talk about Bibles in today's um, episode as well. So that's something for you to be thinking about. I also just, it was in the pre-roll session, but I also just want to remind you that if you can't come to one of our live ULEAD events, and we have several that are coming up starting in July, you know, beginning more of them in July, August, and September, we've got several coming up, but if you can't make it and you want training for your women, we do have a virtual option, and it's only $25, so you can go to lifeway.com slash slash you lead virtual and you can purchase that as a download and you're going to have all these sessions that you can use with your team and it's good until march of 2023 so it's a very inexpensive way for you to get some great training from from some of our trainers on subjects that are really really helpful so i wanted to mention that as well now we have a new initiative happening at LifeWay, and it seemed to really fit really well with our t our topic that we're going to have today. So I've asked Elizabeth Hyman to come on and for Elizabeth to tell us a little bit about LifeWay Women Academy. So Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. Yeah, this is so exciting to be a part of this. So this is my first webinar, so uh, be gracious in how I'm like where my eyes are and all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to get used to this, but um, I wanted to tell y'all about the LifeWay Women Academy. So like Kelly said, it's a new initiative and it was born out of surveys. We surveyed a lot of ministry leaders, women and pastors and asked what they saw as the greatest ministry needs in their churches. And um, so a lot of them we heard from where they had women who didn't feel confident to lead Bible study. They didn't feel prepared to study the Bible for themselves. They didn't feel confident in their handling of scripture to study and to teach God's word. And we also found that there's kind of a missing piece between our LifeWay Women Bible Studies, which are amazing and great, and then our seminary courses, which are also amazing and great. And great. We have this like gap between the two. And so we had women who want to continue their theological education, but maybe don't feel ready yet for seminary or because of the season in their life that they're in, they can't do a seminary class. And so we wanted to kind of fill that gap and provide some courses for women that do that. And so Lifeway Women Academy is going to be an online on-demand initiative. It's courses taught by women for women. And so we just really saw this as an opportunity to build confidence and competence in studying and teaching God's word. And so we're really excited about it. We're launching in October um, with a course. Our first course is going to be called How to Study the Bible, Hermeneutics 101. And it's going to be taught by Jen Wilkin, who you've probably heard of, um, Julia Higgins, Dr. Julia Higgins from Southeastern and Elizabeth Woodson. 
So we're really excited to get those three together to teach this course because they are the experts in this field. Um, it will be nine sessions long. And like I said, it's online and on demand. So you can kind of do the first session in April and the last, well, in October, because that's when it's available, in October and the last session in April, or you could binge it all in one weekend, but we would not recommend that. Um, there will be kind of like recommended reading, quizzes maybe to make sure you're just learning what you think you're learning um, and getting those answers correct. And um, it's gonna be all online. So wherever you have an internet connection, you can do this. And um, so we'll, you'll just learn how to study and interpret scripture rightly and confidently. And then to kick off this new initiative, we are having a launch event because you know, Lifeway Women, we love to get together and we love to talk about God's word. And so we're gonna do that October 14th and 15th at an event called Symposium, which is just like a fancy academic term for a party where we all just like nerd out <laughs> for a couple of days. So Jen Wilkin will be teaching. We'll have breakout sessions by some of your, the women that are leading this webinar. Um, and we're just gonna talk all about the Bible, learn about the historical con and cultural context, learn tools of the trade similar to what you're learning here today and more. And so we're excited about that. That's gonna be at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina. So. That was a lot of information, but if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them in the chat and I can try to chime in and answer. It's all brand new. So there's a lot that we don't know yet, but we're really excited to get to deliver this to you all. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, if you have any questions, I'm going to have Elizabeth just stay on just for a couple of minutes. And so put it in the chat section and Elizabeth will be happy to just kind of, you know, answer any questions that you might have about that. Um, it says live stream option for symposium. Talk about that, Elizabeth. That is an unknown at this point. We um, are still exploring our options for digital content for the, I, I don't think it's going to be live stream, but there might be some digital content available later. So um, we, we just don't know yet. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the answer right now. And I've already noticed that a lot of people have been signing up. I mean, I think, I, I mean, when we have a capacity, so it's yes. not something you want to wait around for. Um, it's also, you know, the Southeastern Seminary in the fall is probably, it's just beautiful. So yes. Definitely a place that you would love to come and maybe bring a group. Uh, and then, of course, uh, also just mentioned that, you know, the Lifeway Women's Leadership Forum is in November in Nashville. So pick one of those two. And um, But the symposium definitely is going to be for those people who really want to know, like, how do I get into, you know, what am I going to be doing with the academy? Do I want to, you know, how many courses do I want to take? And by then we should have some good ideas of some of the, you know, different courses, but we know we're going to have that first course. Yes. So yeah, that's good. The symposium is um, going to be like the nerdy people. That's who we're, and, and I include myself among those. So we're excited to nerd out, but that's who the symposium is kind of going to be for. Yeah. Absolutely. And there is a link that Catherine put in the chat section that will take you to the website at lifeway.com and it'll tell you about the symposium and also tell you a little bit. Um, and we want to know like if you will sign up, Elizabeth, they could sign up to get more information about Lifeway Women Academy. So they can do that on our website, correct? Yes, that's at lifeway.com slash academy. And I'll put that link in the chat as well. Okay. Awesome. And then that way you're getting the emails so you know when things are going to happen. And so we definitely want you to make sure that, you know, you sign up for those emails so that you can be ready to, to jump in. So, yes. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks, Elizabeth. I appreciate you. And, you know, she can stay on for a few more minutes if I jump in after the polls or whatever. But Elizabeth, I told her, I said, you can just come on when you can and then you can get off when you want to as well. And if you don't know, Elizabeth and I do the Marked Podcast. So if you want to put the faces to the podcast, um, this is us. And so uh, we love getting to do the Marked Podcast. Thank you all so much for, for joining us on that too. So thanks so much. All right, everyone. I am going to just talk just a minute because, you know, we love giving away things. And last month we did something special that we had never done and we're going to do it again so if you missed last month we are offering the opportunity for you to get um, a free ebook of my ministry to women the essential guide for leading women in the local church so if you there the, michelle or catherine they're going to put the link in there so what we need you to do is we'll 
you can go and you have to use a promo code that's called men to women free and so you can go and get that ebook for free i mean like that's awesome so we don't we don't do that a whole lot and it's only good through june 30th of 2022 so if you're watching the playback of this um later i'm sorry but we're only doing it through june 30th of 2022 and then also, if you sign up for the Ministry to Women newsletter list, you can go to LifeWay.com, Ministry News, and we are going to like pick somebody out of all of the people who are signed up for this newsletter. And someone is getting a free Bible Study Insider box this month. And if you don't know about Bible Study Insider, like it's a huge box of resources. So uh, we love talking about Bible Study Insider, but one of you is going to do that. So one of you is going to win that if you sign up for the Ministry to Women newsletter. So definitely want you to do that. All right. I want to make sure, Elizabeth, I didn't see any other questions. But feel free to put those in the question section later, too, if you want to. So thanks again, Elizabeth, for, for being with us today. Thank All you. right. Thanks. Um, also, I I want to just introduce you to the panelists today. Um, we've got Courtney Vesey, Gayla Parker, and Cynthia Hopkins. I'm going to have them introduce themselves here in a second. But let's do a poll. Let's, let's start with a poll. I'm going to launch it because we want to know this. We want to know how much time you normally set aside for teaching preparation. If you are, um, if you're a Bible study teacher, how much time do you spend getting ready to teach or even maybe facilitating a study? So I'm going to launch the study. Here we go. Do you spend about 30 minutes? How about an hour or a week or a month? And I know there's all different time periods in between, but It'd be kind of fun just to see how many, you know, how much time you take when you're preparing to teach. I'm watching you guys out of about, we've got about 20, 30%, 40% of you voting. All right. Anybody else think about it? Wow. Some of you study for a really long time. I'm super encouraged by this. Okay, I'm going to give you just a few more seconds if you want to participate. All right, five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to end the poll. And I'm going to show the results. So 49% of you say that you spend about a week. So about the week before you're going to teach it, you're spending time looking at that material, which is incredible. 23% of you said a month, and 26% of you said an hour. And so, hey, that's really amazing. So um, thank you for you know sharing that with us. Let's go to one more poll because we want to know how you normally study the Bible. Okay, what is your kind of your go to so that we, we kind of get an idea of where your Bible study habits are. So the options that we're giving you, I just launched it, is maybe you do your own study on your own. Maybe you're in a Sunday morning group. Maybe you're in a Bible study, women's Bible study. Maybe you're the Bible study facilitator teacher. We'd like to know the difference if you're a participant or you're a teacher facilitator. Or maybe you teach children or students because that gives us a little bit of an idea of things that and ways that we teach because there's different audiences there. So that's really good to see that. All right, you guys are in there and you are answering the question pretty quickly. I'm watching you. Just as a just as a note, I see someone that's raising their hand. They hit the raise hand button, and we can't necessarily like see that as well. So if you want to just put a question in the Q and A, that would be probably best. So thanks for doing that. All right, I'm going to end the poll, and here I'm going to share the results. So it was really um, pretty even between you do your own study. Sixty nine percent of you said that. And then 65% said Bible study group facilitator teacher, that that's kind of who you are. So you could, you know, you could answer multiple ways and stuff. So then also um, looks like 33% of you said you're a participant, you're in a Bible study, which thank you for joining us because that way we know how to direct, like when you're studying, like when you're getting ready to participate, that's important. And 10% um, of you said you teach children or students, and 15% of you said that you study on a Sunday morning group. So that's really helpful. Thank you guys for participating in those polls. All right. Yeah, you know what? Um, 
Rita, I'm seeing your comment in the chat section. Um, I do think sometimes those polls don't come up on a phone or on an iPad. I think that may be just a little bit different. Um, so I'm, I apologize for that. Um, Courtney, let's start with you. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are. And we're going to do some introductions. Hey everyone, my name is Courtney Beasy and I live just in the panhandle of Florida uh, near Tallahassee, so go Seminoles. And uh, part of what I do in ministry, a large part of what I do is that I travel um, as a Bible teacher very often to women at conferences and teen girl conferences and teach in various ways and uh, through different partnerships with that. And uh, one ministry, the which I steward, is called Brunch Ministries. And also I do this through LifeWay with our ULEAD training and other opportunities like this today and Prison Fellowship. And then another um, entity that hopefully I'll be joining with soon called Bible Mesh that I would encourage all of you to kind of check out as well. It's a little bit in between what Elizabeth just explained and the seminary world as well, but another uh, just outlet for you all to learn uh, just different things about the Bible and uh, different levels of teaching with that. Uh, but I will also be joining you all at the symposium in October. So I look forward to that. So I'll be teaching on biblical languages there. So I hope a lot of you will plan to join us. And I would love to see you there in person. Thanks, Courtney. Gayla, why don't you hop on next? Sure. Hi, everybody. I am Gayla Parker coming to you from Arkansas, um, which is home for me and a lot of fun. Um, I have over 40 years of experience in ministry, which I can't believe it's been that long, um, either serving as a pastor's wife or as an international mission board missionary for 15 years on a couple of state conventions as the women's consultant in Arkansas and also in Maryland, and spent some time working for National WMU out of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, currently, I am an adjunct professor at Washita Baptist University, and my students are taking finals today, so y'all can pray for them. Um, and I also serve at a pregnancy resource center as their executive director. Um, I'm finishing up a PhD in systematic theology through Southwestern Seminary and Bible study is my love and my passion and, um, and biblical languages as well. So guys, I hope that I see you at a LifeWay event soon, or if not, that I see you at a women's event. I do spend a lot of time traveling and speaking at um, women's retreats over the weekends and things like that. So anyway, hope to see you soon somewhere. Thanks, Kayla. All right, Cynthia, let's do a quick introduction for you. Sure. I'm Cynthia Hopkins from Houston, Texas, actually just outside of Houston in a place called Baytown, um, where my husband is the associate pastor at our church. We have two grown kids and a daughter-in-law and one nearly three-month-old grandson who uh, he looks like he's really interested in this, in this webinar. And uh, I'm just imagining all of your faces with that same sort of expectation for this next hour. So, um, but I work remotely from here for LifeWay and I've been writing studies and devotions and articles for a lot of, a lot of years. And now I'm on the custom curriculum and short-term studies team. So I get to write studies and devotions for churches all over the country, which is an absolute gift, and, and I love it. I also do quite a bit of teaching at various church events and have a nonprofit ministry for women um, that has partnered with church plants across Canada over the course of about the last six years. And uh, today, I'm just so grateful to get to talk with all of you about, about the treasure that we have in God's word and ways that equip us to study and teach it. So thanks for being here. Thanks, Cynthia. So just the quick introductions, you can tell like between Courtney and Gayla and Cynthia, they have various experience and they have really great experience. And so I think they're going to be able to just give you a lot of great information. And I do want to preface this with, we had this conversation about the direction we wanted to go on this particular webinar. And our thinking is that we, we're not, we're not focusing so much on like Bible studies and picking a Bible study, but we want to give you what are the resources you need as a Bible study teacher? Like if you're teaching, what are some things that will be helpful to you as you become a better Bible study student or teacher? So that's where we're focusing today and we hope to maybe give you some good insight there. So let's, we're going to start with Bibles and I mentioned that earlier and Courtney, I'm going to give you this first question and I'm going to ask you, Let's talk a little bit about Bible translations. Why is a good Bible translation important? And then just, you know, what, you know, what, what are the differences? Give us a little bit of input on that. 
Sure. Well, when it comes to um, the different versions that we have of our Bibles, I think it's really important to look at them like official translations versus more of synthetic translations that we have. And so the official ones, some of them, most likely many, many of you use like Christian Standard Bible, uh, New American Standard Bible, um, versions like that, or what we would call more of a literal translation. And so those are strictly based on the Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic texts and trying to get as close as the translators can to those original languages so that we are getting an accurate representation of what was being said there in the languages in our English translations. But then you've got these great synthetic versions as well, such as probably many of you have heard of or use uh, one called The Message by Eugene Peterson uh, or the Amplified Bible, New Living Translation, ones like that where we wouldn't call those necessarily official or literal translations, but again, more what I would term as like synthetic. And, but you can trust those translations as well in the sense that like Eugene Peterson, for instance, if you study about who he was, he knew the languages like none other. He was a scholar and it took him, I think something, maybe, maybe some of you can speak into this 20 years to do the message uh, version. And what you're seeing there is he is trying to get at the essence of what was being said in those languages for the modern reader. And when you're reading those side by side, it just helps you to understand a different uh, perspective and how we can understand it more today. But uh, what you're seeing in different uh, versions of the Bible, if you, if you do not know the biblical languages for yourself or you haven't maybe had the opportunity to study those, when you lay out English translations all in front of you, when you're studying a passage or when you're preparing to teach, you are seeing the translators wrestling with the original languages. And so you can look at the different English translations that are in front of you and the different words that they give in the English uh, for the same word in a same passage. And what you're seeing is that they are wrestling with those languages and trying to give you uh, the different nuances that that can come out from those original languages. Um, and we'll talk about that, I think, a little bit later on, getting more into the languages. But I did want to recommend a resource uh, when it comes to this. Uh, Gordon Fee uh, and uh, Douglas Stewart, they've come out with several different uh, very helpful tools for studying the Bible, uh, how to study the Bible, uh, for all, how to read the Bible for all it's worth, how to read the Bible book by book. But uh, Gordon Fee also partnered with Mark Strauss in a book that's called How to Choose a Translation for All It's Worth. And it's a guide and an understanding for how to use different versions. And so there he's going to give you a lot more um, explanation as to the different versions and why there are different versions and, and how and when best to use uh, different ones for your teaching. But again, I encourage you, uh, we all have ones that we like to memorize in, that we maybe like to teach from specifically. And I think that's going to be dependent on, um, you know, your time in the text and what you feel is best and comfortable with, with the version that you're teaching. But get all those English versions out in front of you when you're studying and when you're preparing to teach, because then you're going to see the nuances going on in the original languages and kind of get a better picture of an entire uh, vision of the word and the passage that, that is being uh, spoken about in those different passages. Okay, so Courtney, let me ask you this. Um, which, what is your, I mean, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, you don't have to pick a favorite, but if you, if you have one that you is like your go-to translation, what would you say is your go-to? Um, well, gosh, it does, it does um, vary. Again, I, I very much practice what I said. I like to have different English versions in front of me, whether that's on a screen and I'm comparing them or the physical versions. I typically teach out of New American Standard uh, Version because I found that to be, I, I do, I have studied the biblical languages. Uh, Gayla mentioned that. And I'll touch on that again a little bit, like I said later on, and tell you maybe a little of my background there, because that's not something to be intimidated by, but it is something to be respected. It, it's a lot of work, um, but the Lord has offer, offered, I've been able to have the opportunity to study those. Um, but so I have found the New American Standard to be uh, very uh, close, closely literal, you know, to the original languages. Uh, but I also do like the CSB and I, I often will refer to that while I'm studying, but I often teach out of the NASB. I memorize an NIV because that was the first version, the older version, I believe it was, is it 1995? I, uh, that was one of the first ones that I was introduced to as a teenager, so I often will memorize in um, NIV, but often I teach out of a New American Standard Version. 
Yeah, that's good. Cynthia, mm -hmm. what about what's kind of your go to? You I know you probably have to do your work in CSB because you work for Lifeway, but is that your go to or do you like to use a, a certain other one too? I do love the CSB and it is fantastic because that's the translation that I'm in every day with work, but I don't just use it um, in, in in my work. I use it for my own personal study and teaching. It's, you know, it's it's faithful to the original text and it's also really easily readable and it's engaging. Um, you know, I try not to teach or or write in way using words and sentence structures that I don't use in conversation. And on some levels, I, I think that's that's a really valuable goal in a Bible translation also. Um, also, the CSB uses inclusive language, not in places where scripture clearly uses male specific pronouns, but in places where the original language is understood um, to refer to both males and females, which is really helpful to see, particularly when you're teaching women. So yeah, CSB is my go-to. Yeah. What about you, Gayla? Um, I'm going to actually be with Courtney a little bit on this. I sit, typically sit with three or four translations in front of me, um, but for study purposes, I go to the NASB because it is the closest to what the original languages are on a word for word as close as you can get to word for word basis. Um, but for memorization or when I'm reading a scripture and teaching a group of women, I typically read either from the CSB or the NIV because they're, they flow much easier. Um, but even when I'm preparing, I'll start with an NASB and then I'll look at the CSB, I'll look at the NIV, and then I'll even go to the message and see how he laid it out and how, how you know, the various people that wrestled with those languages, what they ended up with it with the end of the day. And so an example of that is like just the simple word and that we use in English. In Greek, there are multiple forms of and, and Courtney knows this better than I do. Hebrew is mine, Greek is hers. Um, but they have different forms of and, and so they use and for things that are related, like the, uh, the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. That and would be one and because of the way they're related. And then there's another and that's for unrelated things. If you think about when we go to the grocery store and our grocery store list, that's completely unrelated. We don't have that in English. And so it's interesting to look at how the translators deal with some of those things. But NAS, NASB is typically the closest to what the original languages have for us. So for study, that one, for speaking, NIV or CSB. Okay, that's awesome. I also want to make sure that you that you saw in the chat section when when Courtney and Gayla and Cynthia are referring to different um, maybe books or some resources we put together um, and one of our graphic artists at Lifeway did this. We put together a PDF that kind of lists. So some of you may be sitting there with a notebook trying to write all this down. I want to just ease your mind really quickly, like go to this PDF and download it. And then that way you've got all the information that they're going to share today. I meant to say that up front. Um, but yeah, thank you for just kind of like giving us a good, you know, just, you know, it's good to have a good translation. It's also good to have like different study Bibles and things like that. So those are good too. So I'll tell you what, um, Galeb, what are some good questions? that we should consider when we begin to start to study something as we prepare, what are the questions that we can, we should consider when approaching the way that we study the Bible? You want to talk about that? Sure. Whenever you're looking at a passage of scripture, one of the first things to do is always to look at what comes before and what comes after and to start asking yourself, how are these things related? Because sometimes they are. Sometimes they're related in a comparison fashion. Sometimes uh, they have things in common. Sometimes it's a principle that's in common. And we especially see that when Jesus has, um, there are parables that kind of follow each other back to back to back. We'll see a common theme that's going through. And so one of the, the first things to do when you're getting ready to study is look at what came before the passage that you're looking at, what came after the passage that you're looking at, and then start asking questions. Are, are these related? Um, did the same person write this? Where did this come from? Where were they? Who was the audience that was being spoken to when it was written? What would things have been like for them um, for when they were hearing this? How, what kind of ears were they hearing it with? Um, and then begin to think about what are the differences that I have today? What it, what's different for me 
than for them. So if we think about um, Mark 2 and the paralytic being carried to the feet of Jesus, um, for us today, we have interstates and we have all of those things. They didn't have that then. So start thinking about, well, gee, I wonder what it was like for them to carry the paralytic on a mat, which would have been a blanket that they would have been carrying. I wonder what that would have been like. And they were on dirt roads, which means their feet probably got dirty and they probably got tired and they probably got hot and start thinking about those things in relationship to the story. And then think about, okay, what would it look like for me if I were trying to get an injured person someplace for help today? That would be, you know, grabbing your cell phone and calling 911. It would look a lot different. So the circumstances that we're that are different, the culture is different, the cities are different, the things are different. But what are what is in common in that passage of scripture for the four men who carried the paralytic and for us today? The same thing is still common is that it's important for us to reach out and to help others in need for the sake of introducing them to Jesus Christ. So asking, what was it like for that audience today? Um, what is it like for me today? What is the message that I think is coming from that passage? And then lest we take ourselves astray to always look and see if what I'm thinking that passage says lines up with all of the rest of scripture because God never contradicts himself. And so we never want to pull out a random pack passage and give an interpretation to it because that's what we want it to say, but that doesn't align with what all of the rest of scripture says. And so it's super important as we're looking what was said before, what was said after, what was the audience of that day hearing, what were their circumstances like, how does that translate for me today? What is the central message? And then how does that central message align with the central message of the entire passage of scripture? And, and if we can't get that alignment to work, then we need to go back and dig a little deeper. That's so good. Those are great, great questions to ask. Um, Cynthia, I want to ask you because you, your job is writing curriculum. You're thinking about the teacher in that um, when they're doing that. So let's, I, I would love your input just to kind of think through like, as you think through how you're writing some curriculum or studies, um, what are maybe you have some go-to resources that you like, but kind of give us a little hint of that process of how that looks for you. Yeah, so uh, I write curriculum every week and every week on Sunday mornings, I use curriculum written by somebody else. So I've, I've start, sort of come around on that. I know a lot of people want to write their own curriculum, and I think there are cases where that is absolutely the right thing to do. I, I used to do that myself all the time, but I say that I've come around on it because I think there's a caution that comes with that. You know, in nearly every endeavor I can think of, it's made better when somebody else is speaking into your process, right? Um, like that's why you're here in this webinar. And as far as facilitating discussion goes, using other resources is really key because even if you don't use the questions that are given to you in curriculum, those questions help you form, form your own. And curriculum gives you a scope and a sequence that when we work alone, sometimes we miss. You know, in LifeWay curriculum in particular helps you study the whole counsel of God's word over time. And it has a plan for doing that. So explore the options available to you for sure. LifeWay has quite a few and they all have online samples for you to look at. One of the specific resources, go-to resources that I'll mention is smallgroup.com, but I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a little bit, so I'll hold off on that. But the thing about curriculum resources is that all of it is a tool. It's not something to form your study and discussion all together, but it's, it gives direction and, and it acts as a springboard that'll help you go deeper. As far as the process goes, um, writing and asking questions is always a big, a big thing people wonder about. I always try to ask myself the questions I write in a study and answer them myself beforehand. I, like, I think that one step is so incredibly valuable. If you struggle to answer a question you're planning to ask other people, chances are pretty strong <laughs> that they're going to struggle with it too. If you answer it quickly in just one word or just a few, other people probably are going to also. If you have a question about scripture, other people probably will too. So, so I just try to keep all of those things in mind in, in, um, in writing studies, especially with questions. Ask them of yourself um, if you're leading a group because that's going to help you know um, whether or not it's going gonna, it's gonna to land with, with the women that you're teaching. Yeah, Cynthia, just while we're on this, do you have some things that you just like, you tend to like pull out when you're writing or you're thinking through a Bible study? Are there some resources or tools that you just have kind of at the at the ready? Um, yeah, so 
I lean heavily on the um, the Holman commentaries. Um, I just my answers are going to be kind of different from from um, the others because we're just we're in different spaces. Um, but I'm I'm I like the Holman because it's so great with application, um, and and that's where I'm usually looking when I'm when I'm writing and I'm 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 leaning on those uh, for that. So. Oh, home and commentary. Um, also, I mentioned smallgroup.com, and we'll talk about that some more a little bit. I also like to go online to some of my favorite um, preachers to their websites, and I'll search a passage to see what messages they have on the on that particular passage, and maybe read um, or, or or watch. I don't do that a lot when I'm writing because you know I. Well, I'm I'm lazy for one thing. I don't want to have to footnote things, but um, and I don't like to use a lot of of long quotes because I think it's just hard for people to follow when you're teaching, um, unless you've got something that's really just pithy. Um, then I try to stay away from that. But it is helpful in understanding the text itself is to see how God has spoken to other people in that process. So those are kind of my main my main ones. Yeah, and I, I would even say the Holman commentaries, they're very readable, like that's a very, that's very much a commentary that um, anyone, a lay teacher could use and understand it's not as academic, but it's still really good like information and it'll even give you some illustrations if you're, you know, looking to teach so I I've used the Holman commentaries a lot when I've been getting ready to teach something. So I think that's a really good, um, a good resource for them. Um, so, okay, Courtney. We did, we mentioned something about biblical languages and we know the understanding, you know, like why it's important to have that in our translation, but there's some resources that can help us, like maybe a lexicon or things like that. So in Bible dictionaries, talk a little bit about why that's important to us. Uh, well, let me give you a little bit of my background in the biblical languages. Um, uh, I was a broadcast journalism major in college and on my way to, I played volleyball in college as well. So I was on my way uh, to be a grad assistant um, at, at Florida State University with volleyball and study on further in communications. And the Lord uh, radically called me into ministry my my last semester of college and kind of sent me on a journey there. And I and I heard him uh, guide me and say to me in a quiet time, I want you to go to seminary. Well, I did not know what you did there. I did not know where they were. I just began to go on a, a journey of visiting different ones. And when I went on a visit to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and again, I, I visited uh, many, but I, I just knew that's where the Lord was, was leading me. And so when I arrived at one of the original or the initial ministry fair, the kind of things that you do and to get to know professors and such, I was talking to the president of the school and I literally was like, I don't know why I'm here. Uh, I just know God told me to come. And I got in and here we are. And he said, well, what do you, what do you call to do? What do you love to do? And I said, I love to teach and I love to write. My undergrad again was in journalism. He said, well, if you're going to teach and you're going to write on the Bible, then you need to learn the languages. And I, I said, I, I don't know what languages you're talking about, but I'm going to do it. And so I, I didn't, I really didn't know. Um, and it was, I, but I was registered, um, an advisor put me in Greek because of what I said I wanted to study. And uh, trust me, you don't want to learn that the original language of the New Testament was written in Greek in a Greek class. Okay, that's very hard, but that's my story. Um, but I fell in love with it and had kind of a knack for it. And of course, the original language of the Old Testament is Hebrew. And so I, I did a Master of Divinity in Biblical Languages and, and stuck that out. And but uh, so the important thing with that, if you have the opportunity to go to seminary and, and today, there's so much great opportunity online to do that, um, because uh, you are able to uh, look at those original languages and really begin to understand the nuances of the word. What are the what kind of duty are the words doing uh, in the Hebrew? It's an old, it's a more uh, ancient language, so it's more static. So words kind of do double duty, and it depends when you're looking at it. Uh, who who's saying the word depends on what it's what it how it's being communicated differently. What you're seeing in the English, um, but again in the Greek, you know, you've probably heard of the word love, for instance. Uh, there's about four or five different words for love in the Greek, you know, so when you're looking at those original languages or even another word like fear, again, four or five words for fear. So when you're looking at the English, you can ask yourself, well, what kind of fear is he talking about? What kind of love? 
And so when you're able to look at those languages, you can get a better understanding of that and then communicate that a little bit deeper. Um, but we all may not have the opportunity uh, to, to study that in seminary. But if you are in seminary out there, I do encourage you to not get out before you take some of the languages. Because listen, a, a lot of things that we study at seminary, you get them at a deeper level there, whether that's women's ministry, uh, children's ministry, what, uh, whatever it is that you're studying, uh, biblical studies. But um, you can also learn those tools deeper in other places too. But one of the only places that you can really go deep in the languages uh, while you're in seminary, that's one of the only subjects you can only do at seminary, you know, that you're not going to really learn many other places. But I do want to um, tell you about a few resources that you can access if you're not able to study in that depth. Um, there are some great tools out there. One is that I really love is called Biblingo. And you can go to biblingo.com. And they have various levels at which you can start, and they will provide you with teaching, depending on the level that you sign up for, um, flashcards, digital flashcards, language tools. Another great resource is the Biblical Languages Center, again, an online program that you can join, and they have all different levels. Even if you've studied the languages before, uh, you it will enhance your study. It will continue to take you further in that. I have looked at local, I've taken a local class um, at a local university with a rabbi who was teaching Hebrew uh, just to continue to enhance my language understanding and my study of the text uh, in that way. Um, but I, I, I encourage you all to not shy away from it. You've heard my story and it's just been a lot of hard work to dig in there. Um, there's no easy way to learn languages. You just have to uh, work at it. But it's, it just renders such benefits. And I had a message just this week from a, a, a woman who uh, had attended ULEAD back in the fall. And I talked about the languages some. And this, this always comes out when I'm teaching, the, the usefulness of the languages and how it just takes our what we're understanding from black and white version to colored version, you know, of, of understanding the text. But um, she said, you know, my, my daughter has a tutor that comes, uh, a homeschool tutor, and she took Greek in college. And guess what? She's tutoring me in Greek and we're learning, I'm learning Greek uh, after she's done tutoring my daughter in homeschool. So um, I just look at the different opportunities that you have. It's not impossible. And it's definitely there are ways to access this for yourself. Yeah, that's really good, Courtney. And um, Elgin Hillman, who's on the chat um, section, also made a great comment about just, you know, when we're talking about languages and things like that, also consider who your audience is. Like, you don't want to frustrate your group. So if you're trying to impress them with, like, the Greek is this, or the Hebrew is this, like, understand the content. And, like, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be too simple, but it doesn't have to be too complicated. And I think that, you know, saying that is a really good um just a comment for us to to consider so thank you for saying that and then i think you know just mentioning even like some online tools gala you've introduced me to some online tools um talk a little bit about some of the things that are available just you know for women that want to to look at like maybe a, a word or something yeah sure i sure will um first of all christine moore i think ask a question about attending school later in life and so um, yes, Christine, if you would like to email me about that, parkerg at obu.edu, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that. Um, yeah, so one of the things, I mean, Courtney said a lot of the things about language. My The language that I love, the biblical language I, I fell in love with first was Hebrew, um, and it came from a Hebrew professor, and I absolutely adore Hebrew. Um, and like Courtney said, it can take something from black and white to color as, as you get to know it, but not everybody can study that. And biblical languages in particular are very difficult because no one speaks them anymore. So there's no way to practice other than looking in, looking in the text and studying. But there are some great websites that you can go to. So the one that um, is being referred to that, we, that I use a lot with my students is called stepbible.org. Um, stepbible.org will provide information in both the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. Um, you can just put in your text up at the top and it'll pop it up in the Greek and you can choose words and it'll pull out um, some studies that have been done on those words to help you get some better understanding of them and the different levels of meanings that they can have. Super, super easy to use. It's free. Um, it's like having a lexicon at your, at your fingertips that you can use. Very, very easy to use and can be very helpful for someone who's 
not in school, has no intentions of going to school, but would like to dig deep into what sort of those words mean. Um, another thing that's kind of fun that we didn't talk about when we met before, but you can do daily dose of Hebrew or daily dose of Greek. That's um, a YouTube thing that's out there. It's also free. It's two minutes. So you can listen every day. You can get your daily dose of Hebrew and your daily dose of Greek for two minutes um, and just learn something kind of random about those languages. It can be a lot of fun to do that. Another thing that I enjoy using is bestcommentaries.com. Y'all, there are thousands, tens of thousands of resources out there, commentaries and writers and just all kinds of things that we can go to. And how in the world do we ever figure out which one we even want to look at? Um, I can't tell you how many I have bought that I thought, why did I buy this? This is not helpful at all. Um, and so bestcommentaries.com, you can refine your search per topic, uh, per passage, per scripture, per writer. There's all kinds of ways that you can refine your search so that you can find the tools that best fit what it is that you're looking at. Instead of spending a lot of time, remember those days of looking in library cards and finding you know, 50 books that you didn't need and five that you did? Um, this can take that away and can help you with that. So those would be my things. Stepbible.org is great. Best commentaries just to refine a search down. And if you just wanna do some fun study, your daily dose of Hebrew, daily dose of Greek. Awesome. All right. So there's also not only just websites, things like that, but there are also some apps. So um, I put all of you on here on the screen. Talk about the apps that you maybe you use. Cynthia, you want to start? You use any? Um, <laughs> I don't really use any apps. So maybe start with somebody else. Um, okay. That's fine. Courtney, do you use any apps? Well, I, uh, I have a, another resource similar to what Gail is mentioning is biblehub.com which is also an app. So when I'm home, I'm using it on my screen, but when I'm on the go, or even when I'm, I'm listening, um, I'm in a, listening to a sermon context, I can pull it up on my app and you can get the inner, inner linear Bible there. So you can look at the, the Greek and English or the Hebrew and English side by side. And it's easy to click on it. You can, and there too, you can click any version, you know, that they offer there of the Bible and see how it changes. But uh, when you click on a particular word there in the Greek, I mean, it'll take you to Strong's Concordance or, or anything else that's, that's available or different lexicons that are there, like Gala mentioned. Um, and, you know, people have done great work in biblical languages for us, you know, in the, in the lexicons that are available. And so uh, that's one that I use, biblehub.com, but it's also an app. So. Okay. Also, okay, so I'm going to take a turn just real quickly because we are like running out of time and I know we've got a lot to still cover, but um, books, like let's also talk about maybe is there a certain atlas that you like to use? Is there a certain Bible dictionary that you've used? Is there something, another maybe New Testament or Old Testament like survey book? Is there something that, that you really think has been helpful to you in studying God's word? Somebody can jump in. Um, I'll, I'll jump in on a couple of things. The Baker Illustrated Bible Handbook um, was done by Danny Hayes and Scott Duvall. It is, um, it's, the paragraphs are short. They're easy to read. They're easy to comprehend. They have good pictures. They give a broad understanding of, of architectural, geographical, and historical context for passages of scripture. Um, it's, it's a great resource. It's not that expensive. It's available on Amazon. It's also available on an app that I like to use called Scribd. Um, Script is a subscription app, but it has tons and tons and tons of books that you can either access as an ebook or as a reader. So for when I'm going to class, if we're looking at the book of Ephesians, I'll plug it in and listen to Ephesians on my way to class. Um, for me, it does all kinds of things like that. But yeah, um, that's a, a real easy one. And I've enjoyed um, a book called 50 Core Truths of the Christian Faith by Greg Allison. And the reason that I have it goes through all of the Christian doctrines and it gives you the key verses a brief explanation of what that doctrine is. And then it also gives you um, questions. If you wanted to take a group of women through the doctrines, it gives you, here's, here's a teaching outline and here are questions to ask in that. And for just learning some basics about the doctrine of God and the Trinity and the Holy Spirit and baptism and the Lord's Supper, it's a, it's a great resource. It's not super thick. Again, it's easy to read. The chapters are short. It's laid out very well, very user-friendly. Um, so that's something that I've enjoyed using as well. Someone else. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that those those uh, the Bible di Bible dictionaries, illustrated Bible dictionaries, Holman has one. Um, 
they're they're just so useful for helping understand places and and cultures a little bit better and um and then I, one thing i do i don't have a specific website but i often will google the pronunciation of of a word in the bible that i'm not sure about i mean that's just such a simple thing but it's it's really helpful um especially if you are teaching I, I've done that several times where I look at a word or I hear someone else pronounce it differently. And I think, okay, did I, have I gotten it wrong all these years? And so I, I've definitely done that a few different times. Um, so that's, that's a good idea. You know, when we kind of got together, you guys, and we were putting together this PDF, you guys actually talked a lot about even just like the resources that are available at your local library or even online and through your library. So um, somebody talk about that a little bit. Well, I definitely have borrowed libraries all across the country. <laughs> if I'm in an area, I will look at what local um, theological schools are there or even some opportunities that you can go to. Um, there are schools and programs where you can go study for a week or, or more on time, like even Princeton Theological Seminary. I've been there and have used their resources or um, different cities. I've, I've been in Nashville for events that we're doing. And in between things, I'm going to uh, Trevecca University or other schools and definitely being aware of those resources that are in your area. If you are near like a, a Beeson or uh, one of our uh, six Southern Baptist seminaries, very often don't, don't shy away from uh, trying to see if you can go there and use their resources and be able to prepare your, your things there. Because uh, very often they're they're open to that or, you know, ready for you to to come utilize what's there. So, well, and even if you have a local library, um, if you're not connected with the school at all, they can search books for you and they can borrow interlibrary. And so, even if you're not close to a school, you can go to a um, your local library and look through a catalog and say, "Hey, I would like to read this," and they can have it sent from another school on a borrowing system that they have. And then also, if there's not a lot of theology, you know, when I think of Oxford, Alabama, where my husband pastored for 10 years, a super small town, nothing real close to there, what in the world would I've looked at in the library, consider biographies, because there are some things that we can learn spiritually from biographies, even that can guide you in looking for other things. When you think about um, the life of Martin Luther or the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, they, they have some great spiritual truths in just their biographies. And those are kind of fun things to read. And so that, that's another way to access your library, read, um, read a theologian's biography, and then let that take you on a way to explore maybe some other things that you would like to read on a specific topic and find out if your local library could borrow from another library, um, where you can read that. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. can, can I touch on that for a second too? Like, what Gayla just mentioned, uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer and Kelly's talking about different commentaries and things like that, you know, some more critical commentaries that I like to use are like the word uh, biblical commentary anchor commentary, those are going to be more critical. Um, and what we would call exegetical where they're uh, just looking at the languages more and things like that, uh, then you've got devotional ones, but there are ones like Diedrich Bonhoeffer, she mentioned not even just his biography, but his book, Cost of Discipleship, is one of the best commentaries I've ever read on the Sermon on the Mount. And I have a few others that I brought with me. I think they're going to be in the PDF, but one is called Smoke on the Mountain uh, by Joy David Men. This is C.S. Lewis's wife. That's one of the best commentaries I've ever read on the Ten Commandments. Uh, she was a Messianic Jew, and so she had a great insight on, on that. And uh, one other person I want to mention is a dear biblical studies mentor of mine. His name is Earl Palmer. And all of his commentaries are this size. This is one on Romans that I've been using for some work I'm doing. And I'm telling you that Earl has taught me so much. Um, I learned the technical languages, you know, from other professors, but Earl has really taught me how to see the text and see the, the locations and see everything that's going on. So I would encourage you to uh, check out my man, Earl Palmer as well, because uh, he, this, this is how big he wanted to write to make it accessible for everybody. And they're just dynamic, so. Good, good resources. Okay, Cynthia, I want to give you just a couple minutes too to talk about smallgroup.com because this is a resource that we have at Lifeway that a lot of people don't know about, but it's really like this can help their entire church. So I'm going to give you a chance to talk about that. And then we're going to do some questions. Okay, so small group, smallgroup.com is a, it's a huge library of customizable discussion guides. There are over 3,000 studies in smallgroup.com. Some of them are video-based, others are not, but they're all ready for you to use. They're written by our team, but it's built for customization because the assumption is 
is that users are going to want to make some editorial and styling adjustments along the way. So it's really um, helpful in that in that sense, in that if you want to make a sermon based guide, a lot of churches do their small groups based on the weekend message. And so you can customize maybe the introduction introductory questions to match what the pastor, um, the il opening illustration or the application section, you can drop in those, those application points that the pastor used and develop some questions around that. But it's a very cost effective way to have just a huge library of questions and commentary at your fingertips. Um, it's $199 a year for just one person, one person to, to use, or $399 a year gives you from that one account access for as many people as you want. So if your church has 20 small groups and you've got one church account, that church can send out invites to all 20 leaders or, or more and, um, and give them access where they could set up their own folders with their own studies um, and that kind of thing. So it's a huge benefit to churches because it's a really inexpensive way to create discipleship pathways for small groups. And then it gives you the tools to help you walk down those pathways. I, you know, it is a really, really great tool. And I, I just think people don't know about it. So like Cynthia said, it might seem like it's kind of expensive for one person. So 199, but go to somebody at your church, like your discipleship pastor or your education minister and talk about getting that group for 399. Like she said, if there's 20 small groups in your church, um, you know, that's $20 for a whole year of content. And then, you know, when you're thinking about doing a Bible study, you've got that information. Um, so all of that. And then of course, you know, we love our life while women, Bible studies and Cynthia has even done some some things to customize some of those studies to make it really accessible for for people on smallgroup.com. So I definitely want you guys to check that out. All right, Michelle, I'm going to bring you on. Um, and we got some questions from the audience right now. Yes, absolutely. One thing I wanted to point out, though, kind of just in summary of everything, is on the Bible study teachers library um, that that our team here put together. Um, at the very begin, beginning, there's it's the seven tips when studying, and it has seven tips of acknowledging the truth and uh, search the truth, discover the truth. Anyway, um, I, I just think that's a great place to start, no matter where you are um, in your level of teaching or the you may be starting out or you may have been doing it for a long time. We've got some who, you know, have 30 minutes to an hour to prepare to teach. Um, and then others that are spending a month or who knows how long preparing to teach something, depending on what they're doing. But I thought this one question, I'm going to put it in the chat also, was really, really good that came through um, because I think it's uh, for all of us. What are some good tips for judging the credibility of biblical resources, whether it's commentaries, trade books, sermons? What are the tips and on how to choose those so that you don't end up in an area where you think, well, this was sold on whatever um, site or sold on Amazon, and then you end up with some false teaching in your hands. So how would you all answer that as far as good tips for judging the credibility of whatever resources you're using uh, in addition to scripture? That's one of the areas where bestcommentaries.com can be helpful. Um, it does a pretty good critique of each of them. And then another good thing to always look at is who endorses the writer. Um, and we can, that will tell you a lot. Um, a lot of us are pretty familiar with more modern day folks that we might question their theology. And if you're reading a book that's endorsed by someone like that, that's probably something you want to shy away from. Um, there are also some things that you can learn by the publisher um, there are publishers that produce more on a, a left side than a right side. Um, Lifeway, by the way, is not one of those. So <laughs> y'all can always be confident in anything that Lifeway puts out. Um, but, but that's another way to, to at least judge what you're going to see. Now, I say that to say as good as commentaries are and as good as writers are and as good as the resources that we have are, there is nothing more valuable in your toolbox than the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so is it okay to read from people we don't agree with? I think it is because it helps us to hone in on our own convictions and make sure that we understand why those are convictions. But there is no one that can speak to you more than the Holy Spirit through the word of God. 
And so if you're reading anything that you question, go to the word of God and search it out there um, and, and make sure that you're on track with that. Any, anybody want to add anything to that? Okay, I'm going to ask one more question because I think we have to close out here really quick. Just what is a word of encouragement that you would give these women from whatever um, space they are in teaching Bible study for them to be a better Bible teacher? What would be the word of encouragement? We've offered a lot of resources and, um, you know, go-to places to help them with that. But what would be just um, some encouraging words you could give them? Yeah, I would, I would just encourage everybody to, um, to allow God to speak to you. Sometimes I think we jump forward and, and we want to go to reading what, what God has taught other people. And that's great. And it's helpful to us at the same time. Um, I think it's kind of like a sandwich, you know, the, the scripture is bread for us, right? It's a foundation and it forms the boundaries of the sandwich, right? But in the in-between, it's, it's also super important. And that's the part that we often struggle with. And to me, the middle is applying those scriptural truths to our circumstances. You know, we, we lay our experiences on top of it and underneath the truth of God's word. You know, and if you think about it, that's how all the scripture writers wrote. The Psalms are full of David teaching us truth about God through his experiences. So did Paul in the New Testament letters. He wasn't necessarily talking about his experiences specifically, but those experiences clearly help him form those truths into the words that we read and receive as believers today. So definitely do your best to rightly understand scripture, use resources, learn what you can, and at the same time, invite God to speak into that with your own experiences, because that is going to land with people um, really in a, in a very connecting way. And I would just add to that to just love, love, love the word of God, ladies. There is there is nothing that will speak more loudly than your love for the Lord, for the word of God and just trying to understand what it says. One of the greatest compliments I had from a student was I want to love God's word as much as you evidence that in your teaching. And, and I can't think of anything. I mean, like I just wept when I read that email, um, but love, just learn to fall in love with the word of God and be passionate about what it says. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you guys, we are right at time. And so I need to go ahead and finish this up. I, we could have, we could have kept talking about this for a long time, but I do want to just reference again, the PDF that is available to you that will also give you a, a lot of this information in one particular document. So thanks, Courtney, Gayla, Cynthia, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we have another webinar coming up in June. We're going to be talking about a really sensitive area that definitely is one of our cultural issues, and that is on um, just gender confusion, gender identity, and how we are dealing with that as the church and as women um, in, our, in your families and in your churches. And so I'm excited for you all to be on that particular webinar. So you can always go to to lifewomen.com. You can just search webinars and you can sign up for all of the webinars for the rest of the year. You'll see them all listed there and that way you're already signed up and you don't have to worry about the next one. So thanks again for joining us and thank you all so much for being our panelists. We'll see you next time.